It's a pleasure to be here with you. My name is Dr. Ann Wairapo, and I'm the Senior Director over Women's Services here at Utah Valley University. I have the great honor of introducing my good friend and mentor, Dr. Susan Madsen, today. Many people internationally know her name, and it is such a wonderful thing for us to have her here at this university. She's associated with so many forward movements that involve women and leadership. As you can see, uh, the Orrin F. Woodbury Professor of Leadership and Ethics, she works in the Woodbury School of Business, but she also operates a lot of very important programs, like this one, Utah Women in Education Forum. And she is a fellow for the Women's Success Center, and so we have an opportunity to collaborate together, and she works also on the steering committee that helps us know what direction we need to go for women to benefit at Utah Valley University. Susan has a, a wonderful family, and I love your boys, but your daughter is my favorite, <laughs> and she is such an amazing young woman. Um, uh, she's been involved in the military and just returned from Seoul, Korea, and I think she was truly happy to see her mother and appreciates now, after going to these places, everything that her mother has done for her. Susan has moved this work forward. She works tirelessly. It's not unusual to get an email at 4 a.m. Uh, on a regular basis. She is the first one up, and she is always working to move the needle. She likes to Skype so she can see your face and the awe that you have at what she's accomplished since you last talked to her. It is true. She is amazing. So again, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Susan Madsen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if this mic, is it working? Okay, wonderful. I am so pleased to have you here. Um, this research and this effort um, that I've been working on uh, is just very interesting. And in my opinion, my humble opinion, looking at trying to get more women to go to college and stay in college is at the foundation of so many things in our state, so much progress that can be made. And I do a lot, some of you know my name from the leadership side, so I do women in education, but also do women in leadership. And one of the things the research is very clear on is that when women are college educated, they have more skills and confidence and ability to really reach out and lead, whether it's in their homes, churches, uh, PTAs, whatever it is, uh, in, in legislature or whatever. They have the confidence and just those other abilities to want to do that. And we just must have more women educated so that we can have more women involved and leading in our state. And I'm very opinionated about that and I'm excited about that. So you'll get a lot of my, my excitement today. Um, so I'm thrilled to be able to share today um, of some various data, but mainly about a study we conducted a few years ago that really explored what in the heck is going on <laughs> in terms of women's decisions to go to college, to drop out of college, to not go to college at all, whatever those decisions are. But a few statistics that I want to run by you. First of all, did you know that Utah has the largest gap in the nation, 6% between a men and women with bachelor's degrees. So, so in most places, you know, if you go to a population, um, you know, in this area it's a little bit wider, but you would just know that you would find 6% more men with bachelor's degrees than women. Did you know that we're the lowest state in the nation in terms of the percentage of students who are female? So across the nation, and, and some would argue this is not a bad thing, um, across the nation, about 57%, actually it's even creeping up almost to 58% of the students are female. So the worry is more about the men. Why are the men not going to college and graduating? In our state, it is, is not that way. And we, so we happen to have, be the lowest in terms of that. We're below the nation. We're not the bottom, but we're the below the nation in terms of of the 18 year olds uh, or 18 to 25 year old women enrolled in college and then graduating from college. And you know, you've heard probably if you're listening to the news or whatever, you hear some of these statistics that we are down there in terms of those things. This one, it was a 2012. It says of 51 metropolitan areas with at least 1 million people, the Washington DC area has the most likely educated population, highly educated population 
and the Fresno, California area the least. The greatest difference between sexes were found in the Salt Lake City area where men per surpass women in bachelor's degrees by 9.3% actually in that area, um, percentage points. Um, so so this is, these are things that are out there, uh, concerns that have been published. In terms of graduation rates, and this is a 2013, you'll see actually some differences between men and women. Most of the data that comes out is tracked by six-year cohorts. And so, um, and, and the LDS mission is changing um, things for women as well, but when you have a lot of LDS men going on missions and they're out for two years, it's really hard to get them graduated in six years, right? Um, and so it throws the data off a little bit. But right here you can see that in Utah, in terms of women who start college and graduate, um, we're anywhere from about 50%, depending on the institution, but around there. And the nation's about 61%. So we're quite behind there in terms of graduating and retaining our women. So we do have a... Uh, not enough, but we do have quite a few women that go from high school to college, right? And I'll, I'll give you some statistics and, and really some reasoning behind that um, and, and what we found. But yeah, we're just not holding them there. We're, they're not finding um, the whatever it is, and we'll talk about that, to actually stay in college and graduate. So we've got some concerns in different ways. So some important considerations when comparing when compared to the nation, actually Utah men and women are struggling, are not man matching the completion rates of their U.S. counterparts. And so as we strive actually to help women and men, uh, we need to not, I mean, each gender faces its own unique barriers. And that's the thing. Some people say, well, let's just do more for everybody. And we do. But it is critical to continue to talk to women just to women. Sometimes they understand or it reaches them different when you say you can actually still go to college part time after you have that first baby. You know, that's that men, that doesn't work so well for men. That, that wouldn't impact them the same for women. So as we strive to improve completion rates of all Utahns, we cannot devalue the focus on women in order to focus on men. We just have to do both of those. And I wanted to, this is an older chart, but I wanted to, and I was just on a, a trip talk and kind of described this without the chart, wanted to tell you, you know, throughout time, I, I still get from some people, I say, oh, you're down in women in Utah because it's those Mormons, you know? It's the, and I remind them that actually in the pioneer days, women were being educated and throughout time in Utah actually at a higher rate than the rest of the nation. So it's been an important, um, an important thing in the state to have women and men educated compared to the nation. So that's, that's a, a good point to make. But in general, if you look at this green line, and we started this data in, in uh, collection in 1987 at, at this state, this is the national. So you can see how the percentage of women attending college and actually graduating has increased. And actually at that point, here's Utah. So we were above the nation in terms of Utah. And you see about around here, 1991, is when we started tipping down. And not necessarily, let me, let me clarify something, not necessarily women, more women dropping out, but as our population grew, the demographics, are you understanding that the demographics have changed? And then you can see in about 2001, it's when the nation surpassed us and we have gone under that and we have not recovered from that. Um, so, and of course, you know some of the m media that's been out there recently, right? This one was about two years ago and put us at the bottom of the state of women in, in America in terms of women in leadership, in terms of college graduation and so forth. We don't love being on these lists. We don't love that, but this, this has taken, gotten us a lot of attention there. And then I love this, you know, Wall Street 24-7, uh, uh, the 10 worst states for women to like live. All right, and Utah was like the worst state. 
And, um, and it, it brings in many different factors, but education is one of those, that we're so low in terms of those. And I just thought I would throw this. This was one of my favorites, and I'm being very sarcastic. Um, New York uh, Post, five places women shouldn't spend their travel do dollars in the whole world. Like Saudi Arabia, El Salvador, people, places where they kill women. And then Utah is what was one of the five listed, Utah. And so again, education was cited there. And then a very recent, just a few months ago, we were uh, cited again at the bottom. And the wage gap is also in that. But again, much of that comes down to the education. Do we like this? No. And do, do I think this is a bad state for women? Heck no. I can say these words. I'm in Utah. Heck no. <laughs> um, I love living in Utah. I love being a woman. I love being a woman in Utah. It's a great place. So we need to just, we need to do work though. Um, some of this is, is, you know, there's always misinterpretations, but there is some reality in these numbers. And figuring out how we can help get more girls interested in college, how we can help more young women understand and then women come back to college is the critical element for all the other pieces that are cited. For the wage gap, for women in management, women in politics in our state, we're very low in terms of that. The research is very clear that the more education women have, the more of these abilities and desires and excitement and passions and energy towards some of these things increase. So in 2009, I was asked by the um, Commissioner of Higher Education in the state of Utah to do some research and figure out, to kind of start a project and a movement and figure out what is going on and how can we understand this a little bit more so we can make changes in the state. So the purpose of this project that I had started in 2009 was to lead efforts within the state to understand and then help try and motivate more young women, girls and young women and women, to, to go to college and then graduate from college, stay there and graduate. And so also in 2011, um, I worked with Governor Herbert on a task force that we explored lots of things and were able to work with some real leaders in the state and started the um, Utah Women in Education Initiative, just shifted the project over to initiative, which we still have now. And that initiative is working to increase the number of women holding degrees and certificates to enable them to more effectively contribute, realize their own potential, and influence and contribute to family, family society, and work context, and whatever they choose. Do you notice that language? Because uh, uh, a lot of people, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, a lot of women in my research, what we discovered is they really link getting a college degree to one thing only. What do you think that is? Yes. And if women don't think that they're going to work, and, and do we have a lot of women not working in the state? Actually, we have a lot of women working in the state, and a lot of people that don't think they will do work. Uh, then you can kind of understand those those. Um, and so right now, I, I, um, we have the initiative going. We have one part-time person. Where is Danielle? Can you stand up? So this is Danielle Christensen, and she's, she's working 15 hours a week. We've got a small staff on that. But she is really focusing on our website, and I hope uh, we've got lots of website cards on the table that, that uh, can give you information, and actually cards if you want to distribute those. We've got some packs of cards that you can do, really focusing on absolutely amazing resources on the website. And Danielle is a mover and shaker on social media. And we've got a happening blog if you're interested in doing uh, some writing for the blog, contact her. She's doing social media as well, and then some outreach as well. So that's what we're doing right now. Thank you, Danielle. Um, and so now I want to dive into the study that we did a few years ago. Um, and I know not everybody has heard it. I've spoken to different audiences um, and just want to acknowledge the Utah Education Network. They're filming um, today and they provide great resources, educational resources to the state of Utah on so many issues and are all over women in education and women in leadership 
and uh, are taping so they can distribute um, this to other people in the state of Utah. The more we understand, the better we can be at being influencers and helping not only ourselves become more educated, but helping girls and young women and, and women uh, do so. So what we did a few years ago was to interview, and we have good data, I'll share lots of good stuff with you, is to interview, um, or we did focus groups, interview like, open-ended, um, on laptops, types, tops, excuse me, on laptops, um, people throughout the entire state. Uh, we were up at Box Elder, we were down at Kanab, Cedar City, different places to really get a feel. And we, and we worked with women from about um, 18 to about 30, and people who had lived in Utah. We wanted to understand some Utah perceptions, some Utah um, you know, experiences of women to figure out what's going on. There are just experiences of being educated and, and making those decisions about educate, education. And so we had about 245 participants, and for a qualitative, this was qualitative and quantitative, for a qualitative study, it's about an hour and a half, but most were around two hours of data. That's a huge sample. I have books where I've interviewed 10 like women governors in the United States, and the whole book is just on 10. So thousands and thousands of pages of coded interviews and statistical analysis um, were put. And so we were able to actually get some great information, good stories, good um, coded things so we could run statistics and figure out what are some relationships and so forth. So I, um, I think you'll be interested in some of this data. So I, I do, as a researcher, always put up some limitations. So one of the things that we really wanted were, were um, a, a real diversity uh, in terms of race and ethnicity and in terms of religion but we had some limitations with that. <laughs> About 80% were LDS, so we have a really, and, and by the way, we have some separate studies by people that did, uh, we had some specific data on Polynesian or Pacific Islanders and also Native Americans, so we have a little other data as well. And, um, and most of our sample, you know, we had some minorities in that, but, but much of our data uh, represents Caucasian folks. Um, and again, we have done some other studies that have looked at other populations as well, um, but mostly in this study that I'll talk, to, talk about. So you can see some of those other limitations as well. So today what I thought I would do is to really focus, and we have so much data, <laughs> we have tons of data, but I thought, what, what would be most interesting to you? A few ahas here and there that can help you as you become even stronger influences on women and girls moving forward. And thought I would focus on the value of education, some intentions, aspirations, that's my favorite part, because we found some really interesting and cool stuff on aspirations that have actually in the last couple of years changed the conversation in Utah. It's been very rewarding. And then some about values and religion, which I, I love um, that piece family backgrounds and some schooling and non-schooling kinds of uh, data as well. So first, let's hit the first one, value of education. You know, before I started to even getting the research, designing the studies, I really felt like I should write a brief, which I did in 2010, called The Value of Higher Education for Women in Utah. I'd been around youth. I have youth in my home, actually. They're 20 to 28 now, so they're not. My house stays so clean. It's, just, it's like a wonderful phase of life. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit off the track there. But, um, but what I really had this gut feeling, maybe one of the variables, one of the issues, is that maybe women don't understand the broad value, all of the reasons you should actually stay in school and get that degree. And so, I wrote this brief, and, and that's on our website, and I think if you haven't read that, you would, you would enjoy that. But then we actually did the data collection and the analysis. And what we found was Utah young women do not generally understand what education is for. The more educated people, so in our sample, we had people that were, never went to college, 
some that just went a semester or two and dropped out, some that went home more, some that graduated, some that had master's degrees. So we were able to st st statistically compare them, and that was fascinating. So the more educated they were, the more they understood why you should have a broad value um, or why there is value in, in getting your degrees. Many of the benefits, actually, that I wrote in my brief were not even mentioned by any of the people. So there's just information that people are not aware of. And by the way, the literature says that most of the benefits outlined um, really come from degree programs, not necessarily certificate. There's some benefits that come from that, but the more education you have, the more benefits you receive. So what we found as well, and this was so interesting, so many people said this, many women stated they don't need a college degree because they will not use it. They just won't use it. And many said that they did not want to go to college unless they knew exactly what they wanted to do. And uh, for example, one person stated, I don't want to waste my time or money. Interesting. We are, in the state of Utah, very high in terms of women in cosmetology school. And women in dental hygiene, you know, you can see if I get this course, then I can do this with it. If I do, and I, I have can't see how people can look in other people's mouths, but, but a lot of people do that, and good for them. I'm glad. Um, but they can say, OK, I'm going to do this, and that will lead to this. But the understanding of math, philosophy, I mean, what does that do for you? It's a waste of time. When those of us in higher education, we know the literature, we know how much your mind gets developed and critical thinking skills and all of those things from education. Um, yeah, this whole waste, it's a waste because they, it's not going to teach them exactly what they want to learn or what they think they want to learn. Now, I think this is a very telling chart. Um, and this is what, and we didn't give them options. We asked them four different questions in different ways to see if they understood the value of education. Look at that first one. That doesn't surprise us, right? They got that. Look how far it is to the next one. I mean, that's shocking. That was shocking to me. I'm like, that's the whole reason to go to college is to learn and be smart and all of that. But only half mentioned at all that was a benefit. Um, next one. Well, there's a lot of them. This was surprising to me. Only 20% had any connection or realization that actually getting a college degree can help them be a better mom, that they could be a better example by having a college degree. Isn't that surprising to any of you? I mean, there is a connection. The research is clear, but they didn't. I don't think people have helped them connect or taught them those kinds of things. And then this last one I wanted to highlight. And only the people that were more educated got that education is about critical thinking, problem solving, community, uh, decision making, um, all of these things, which are general you know, competencies here in college. And uh, so much research on that. I mean, even the, the research on women going to college become better um, shoppers, you know, <laughs> critical shoppers, um, looking at things better. I mean, there's benefits uh, in so many different ways. So to me, this tells us a lot. What do our conversations need to, to be part, you know, include? Some of these things to help them understand there's a lot of reasons that they should be in college. And, what I, and I'm going to go through this next section really quick, but I couldn't help but putting it in here. So these are some things from the briefs. And it's going to be like a fire hose right at you because I'm going to go fast. Um, but I, I want you to get a taste of what the research is saying on why women or men, actually women in Utah or women outside of Utah, anyone should go to college and stay in college and get those degrees. In my brief, I highlight these six areas. Economic, earn more money, better prepared to support self, better job opportunities, better health care, lower risk of unemployment, uh, poverty rates. Four percent, the four percent poverty rate for bachelor's degree recipients was one-third of the 12 percent poverty rate for high school um, graduates. So much less poverty if you have a bachelor's degree. 
The poverty rate for all associate degree re recipients was 7% compared to 9 for individuals with some college, no degree. And by the way, we are at the top of the nation in terms of the statistics, some college, no degree. So we have more than anybody in terms of some college, no degree. And what's sad about that? I mean, it's nice that we get some college in right, right? But in terms of actually getting a job, if you, don't, if you didn't close it at two years and actually get an associate degree, in terms of the economic benefits, you're actually behind someone with an associate degree, even if you've got, and we have so many women, maybe some of you in this room that have four years of college and no degree, you know, almost there, but didn't quite close it. Um, so, so just some good statistics here. Second area, health and well-being. Actually, people with more education live longer lives, have overall healthier lifestyle, lower alcohol abuse, you can see higher fiber, less overweight or obese. My favorite one, I don't have it listed, but you might appreciate this, and, and this is, if I'm irritated at my husband, this is not a benefit, but there's a, a recent study, well, it's about two years ago out of Stanford, that said actually, men who are married to more educated women live longer. So. Um, the research says those that are more educated, and again, some at the associates, but, but more of these at the bachelors, have increased life satisfaction, overall happiness, more resilient and less depressed when you have more education. Third, civic and community engagement you're more likely to vote, almost twice as more likely to vote if you have a bachelor's degree compared to a high school degree. You're more likely to donate blood, feel leadership positions, just be involved in the community. More education moves towards these kinds of benefits. Some other social benefits, societies that have higher levels of education are safer. Less criminal behavior if your society um, is, is more educated. For every year of increase in the average schooling level within a community, there is a 30% decrease in murder. Isn't that kind of interesting? Communities that have well-educated citizenries have fewer uh, incidents of depression and suicide, the more education we have. Fourth, I think we're at four, I don't have my numbers out there, um, parenting. Um, in general, when you compare more educated women, especially to women that don't have any education, they have healthier babies. Women and men who have more education. I mean, and this is something we don't talk about on the parenting benefits, even if a woman is not planning to work outside the home. There are so many benefits, and I'm just giving you a few, in terms of parenting. It is very clear in the research that more educated parents read more to their kids. They prepare their kids more for math skills. Their kids are just more prepared for any of those kinds of things. Have children who participate in extracurricular activities, just better prepared overall. Provide better lifestyles for their children. They work higher paying jobs, so they have more flexibility in their careers and their jobs. And more educated parents have more educated kids, right? And I have done a lot of news reports and TV interviews with this, and I always say more educated mothers have more educated sons and more educated daughters, right? That's a huge benefit uh, for being educated. Um, parent, children of parents with higher levels of educational attainment are better prepared for school, and while in school, they're more likely than other children to engage in ex educational activities with their parents. Children between the ages of three and five whose parents had bachelor's degrees were more than twice as likely as children of high school graduates to recognize all the letters of the alphabet. Isn't that interesting? Um, parents with higher levels of education more frequently participate in their school-aged children um, in a wide variety of activities, ranging from going to the library and doing other kinds of events. And then I thought I would put this note up in terms of the percentage of eighth graders in, um, proficient in reading by parents' highest educational level. And you can see the more education, the better prepared in reading. And then I think we're at number five out of the six. So I'm not gonna go through all these. We, we think of these often, right? 
But uh, that first one is the one I wanted to highlight, is that the more education we have, the better we are at lifelong learning and just continuing to learn throughout all of our lives. Um, and then just you know, writing and verbal and all of these different things as well. And then the final area is self-development. Um, the research shows that more educated women have improved self-understanding, greater independence and feeling of control, better leadership, um, self-esteem, openness to diversity, racial understanding, and you can see the others. So again, a little bit of a fast, but I, I, what I'm trying to do is just help you understand because what we found is women don't understand, and not just women, people who influence women, and that are their husbands, their boyfriends, their kids, you know, their parents, whomever. And, and by the way, I mean, fathers can be, we found critical evidence that fathers in Utah can be a very, very critical influence on their, the choices of their daughters to attend college or not to attend college. So are you sold, ladies and men? Are there? Yes, welcome. <laughs> yeah. um, so a few takeaways from this. Again, I, that, that, all of that wasn't my original research. The first part was. But just from those original things, I mean, what can we do? There's a lot of takeaways, a few things. Parents can start talking about all the reasons to go to college. English teachers could give assignments to write about the benefits of college education. Elementary school teachers can bring in a guest to speak about this. I mean, there's things that we can do to start this conversation um, at an earlier age. So this was, I'm gonna pop into some of the results. This was, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, a theoretical model that we used. Um, but this is the behavior. That means what did they do? Did they never go to college? Did they go, you know, go one semester, drop out? Um, this is what, what we were looking at. And then I'm gonna talk about intentions first and aspirations. In the, in the national model, the Utah, I mean, this aspirations is not there. But what, we, what, what my gut feeling was when I put together this model was that I think we have different aspirations in Utah, so we have to explore those. So we'll look at aspirations, then I'll hit a few things in family background and religion, and then, um, and, and the whole point is, you know, girls and boys, everybody, we're raised with beliefs that then move into the attitudes that then make us aspire. I mean, if we don't aspire to go to college, we're not gonna ever go to college. If we don't aspire to actually graduate, we're not gonna graduate. And then, if we do aspire, then we do some things. We actually apply to go to college and do some things. We save money and so forth. So we'll look at that and with this very specific Utah sample. So let's look at a couple slides for intentions. So these were the things that we looked at. So if you are gonna go to college, that behavior, there's some things, and, and after the fact, we. We wish we would have put a few more in there, but you do what you do for research. So we looked at all these. What we found was interesting, and that is all of them statistically related. So if people did these, and the more the better, they were more likely to go to college, right? Um, but there were a few in our Utah women's sample that came out very strongly, and two that I like to talk about. One top one by far was saving money. If women themselves said that they saved money and the statistics showed the earlier the better because we, we broke it down by elementary school or as long as I remember ever, you know, and then junior high, high school, college. If they statistically said they started saving their own money, um, and I just picture when I was growing up the little piggy bank with and I'm LDS Mormon, very active, so my parents, we had a mission thing. <laughs> you know, we used to put money in the piggy bank, and I think every time you think about that and put money in college, a college thing, you're thinking about, oh, I'm planning for college, right? Very interesting. That was the strongest, and the second one by far was going to college campuses. Actually being, it didn't matter if it was EFY at BYU, or a sports camp at the University of Utah, or a science thing at UVU, or whatever, it didn't matter. And statistically, the more times they said they went to campuses growing up, the better. I remember one specific story. 
of a woman that said, she lived down in Salt Lake City, and she said, every time we drove by, from as long as I could remember, by the University of Utah, my dad would say, you're gonna go there someday. <laughs> and she said, I just always knew, because my dad was Sam that, and then she talked about her family actually parking sometimes and walking around. Her parents would just let her walk through the buildings. And it's very interesting that, that even if it's sport camps, sports camps or other things, the more times they visited campuses. And I'll tell you, sometimes if we rely on the school system, they have, we have limited funds. Is that a shock to you in our K through 12 system? I know that's shocking to some people <laughs> or not. Um, but if, if there's any funding that typically goes to people at what age? Typically like seniors or juniors. When the research is saying that fifth and sixth grade is actually some of the best times to get field trips to go to college campuses and younger. So fascinating. Um, so that's one thing. And this was not a shock. Um, people who took AP courses, math courses, the different kinds of things were the ones more likely to go to college. And we really analyzed the difference in concurrent enrollment with just general, any old class that they could get credits for, or very specific English things that, and that made a difference as well. And so a few takeaways just from this section is, and this is not, so much of this is not just for girls, raising girls, it's raising boys too. So helping them find and, and talk about going to college, but actually saving money for college is important. Influential individuals should provide opportunities for girls and young women to visit college campuses. And young women should be encouraged to take these kinds of courses. One of the most innovative things I heard of a couple years ago was uh, one LDS stake group had and took their stake girls camp, which in my opinion, sometimes in Utah, we have girls resorts instead of camps. <laughs> Sorry, had to say that. Um, but instead of going and camping in tents, they actually drove by shuttles, all the girls to Southern Utah and they started there. And one day they visited Dixie and then they camped out the next, then they went to SUU the next day and hit Snow College. And then isn't that like cool? And they made it all the way up to USU. And I thought, what a great experience. I mean, what a great thing to do. So all kinds of ideas on, and I'll tell you some of these things are just small things. And you know, that, that one was a big thing. <laughs> that would take a lot of work. But sometimes just having these conversations is really critical. So let me head into this next area. Again, if you don't even aspire, if our girls don't aspire to go to college, they're not gonna go to college. So how do we deal with that? And a couple of huge findings in this. First one, and this was a very significant finding. Young women believe that they are being encouraged to go to college or attend, but they're not supposed to graduate from college. Not everyone, but that was a big finding that if they're thinking they're just supposed to go to college, and I remember one specific story about a, a young woman that said, you know, I was always planning on going to college, and I went to SUU for a semester, and that was good. I checked it off my list. I was gonna go to college, and I did my college. Um, and that's what she felt like she was being encouraged to do uh, from her perspective. And so to me, this, don't you see some takeaways right here? I mean, just in our conversations, talking about graduation from college, not just attending, is something that we can do with our own children, our grandchildren, or people around us in church settings or whatever, uh, many settings. This also was so interesting. All but three said that getting education is, more, is important and wonderful. And in the data, they had laptops and they were telling us stories and we, I was there physically with a lot of these two kind of directing them and they would give little pep talks, go to college, it's good, and then we'd look at their demographics and they dropped out after a semester. So they were like saying that it was good, but a lack of urgency. Someday, I don't need to go right after high school. It'll happen someday. What do we know? What do we know? I'm looking at some people that work in the Women's Success Center and they know. Um, and some people would say, well, after my kids are all in school, after, you know, whatever that is. 
What do we know from the statistics? Do the women come back? Very few, and a lot of times, I'm singing to the choir in terms of many of you, the situation is divorce, abuse, real desperation by the time they come back. There are other, you know, there's always situations where that's not the case. Um, but there's this, oh, life will be fine, and I will take care of it sometime. Nearly all women who did not attend or dropped out truly believed they would get their degrees in the future, truly believed that. And so we put some quantitative questions. Are you going to get your degree? 90% said yes. What level? This is looking good, right? This is looking strong. But then we asked them a couple of open-ended questions. So what's your plan for the next five years? Or when, you know? And only 50% had any mention of even associate degrees. It was like, yeah, that sounds good. I'm going to do it. But do I have a plan? No. I haven't really thought about that, especially when it relates to what period of their life? When they're pregnant with their first baby. They haven't really thought any, you know, what happens after that. Not a real plan after that. One other piece in this area, and then I'll get to the next one. The younger the conversation started, um, and a girl decided, made the decision uh, to attend college, the more likely she was to have, uh, have a higher commitment to attend, all of these different things, saved money. So what the point was is the younger the conversation started between parents and other people, aunts and uncles, whoever was talking, grandparents, and we, we looked again at elementary school and younger, you know, junior high, high school, the younger, the more statistically likely uh, when they said, I started talking, you know, when I was in kindergarten or first grade, I remember always talking about this. The likelihood that they were with the ones graduated was very, very high. So let me flip back and talk a little bit about family backgrounds and values, because those things are the start of what lead us to those aspirations, intentions, and the choices that we make to go to college, to stay in college and graduate, or not to even go in to college at all. So let's hit the religion piece. These are three questions we asked. What does your religion teach you about continuing your education after high school? What messages do you think are given from your top church leaders? And about 80%, by the way, were LDS people, so we got a lot of good data in this. Interestingly, the people that were not LDS basically said to us, our churches, if they were active, don't really talk about education. So the data that we did get really was from the LDS population. And then the third one, do your local church leaders talk to you about your education? If so, what do you think they are encouraging you to do? And like I said, I happen to be LDS myself, very active, but I had a couple researchers on my team who were not. And so we had different people looking at the data from our religious backgrounds, which was important as a researcher to do that. But you can see I was really trying to, when I designed these questions, dig down and see. I mean, the whole point is, let's figure out what who, what the influences are and where are those messages coming so that we can understand how to maybe change those messages to better benefit uh, women, girls and women. So first one, what does your te religion teach you? And again, mostly LDS in this piece. Look how many said very important. That's a lot. Um, some moderately important. You can see that list. So that was interesting. My husband, when I started dating, uh, dating not that. Uh, my husband, um, that was a long time ago. Um, my husband, when I started looking at this data, would it took me a couple weeks just to do this section. He kept coming in my office. What are you finding? He was like so interested. And so I got through this, and I'm like, they're saying that their religion is telling them they should go to college. So I thought that was fascinating. Second one, what are your church leaders telling you? A lot say it, you're supposed to go to college. Moderately important, you can see this, that's pretty strong. Still significant, a little less strong, are your church leaders. So about 30%, but it was still in a positive direction and fairly significant. Um, but this one, 
This one particularly was very significantly linked statistically, and I will tell you, second to parents. Parents are the most influential people in the decision that girls and boys make to go to college. But our statistics showed that church leaders, and in the LDS sample, it was bishops were mentioned and young women leaders. Those were the two that were mentioned to make the big difference. If they had mention of people in church encouraging them to go to school, go to college, the likelihood statistically that they were the ones to go was very high. That was a surprise to me. And that, what does that tell us? Ah, we should talk about college in our religion, religious settings. We should talk about it a lot in our religious settings. Um, so a few findings, so, so all of that kind of looked good and we were thinking, so what are some of the issues? So here's a few other ones. Some say if they were actually, isn't this first one interesting? Some say if they were actually more active in the LDS faith, they would have probably have attended college. I thought that was interesting. We had many of those. Many talked of the importance of attending college, but not graduating. So that really came out of the LDS sample. And this urgency that I just talked about, not feeling the urgency. And this one is the one that drives me crazy. <laughs> Marriage, or sometimes when the, a child is born, is the end of college for many women. Many believe that women need to give up or sacrifice their college for the family. It is their duty to drop out of school. That was very widespread. And my passion, my, my is, we need to totally flip that around, that it's your duty as a good mother to actually be an educated mother. It's your duty to do that for your children, for your family. And that's, I think, the message. I mean, that to be truly self-reliant, um, you know, should I say it or not? No, I'll say it. <laughs> Wheat will just last you so long, <laughs> OK? A good education with both. And, and how many, you know, we don't have perfect families with what, what people, some people would say a perfect you know, husband and wife. We have so many single parents and different kinds of family situations. Um, so that is, don't you think that's interesting? So that's good to document that because it helps us understand how to move forward. And then this one was a really big finding too. They cannot see a situation where they can be married, have children, and continue college. It is all or nothing. They cannot see a life of integration. And what we found is, you know, they're in high school and everything's about high school. Then they're in college and everything's about college. And then they get married and, and especially at that first baby, then that's all they're supposed to do. What we didn't find in the data were things like, maybe I can go online. Maybe I can go one evening a week. Maybe my husband can watch the kids and I can go. We didn't find that. It was like, oh, I gotta quit. To me, this is critical. We have got to actually talk about options. There's so many options out there on, on different kinds of ways to continue our education. Um, a couple of quotes here. My religion teaches education is not merely a good idea. It's a commandment. We are to learn of things both in heaven and earth. They say it's important to strive, learn, and study in our lives and seek knowledge from the best books. They encourage getting an education, but do not expect us to get a degree. But on the other hand, here's another one, okay? I feel like my religion strongly encourages continuing education after high school. Our church teaches that knowledge is, is the only thing you can take with you when you die, not cars, homes, etc. I believe this, and that is partly why I went to college. Women are also encouraged by our church uh, leaders to earn a college degree. So we've got really conflicting understanding and data. Family is extremely important, but top leaders strongly encourage women to gain an education so they can teach their children and help support their families. So to me, you know, maybe, and I don't have the data to support this, but maybe it's how it's broken down into their local church groups. When my daughter, thank you for saying nice things about her, um, she, and we live in North Highland, you know, by Alpine, kind of an affluent kind of place. We have a little bubble over there <laughs> a little bit. But um, when my daughter was in um, Young Women for our religion, her Young Women leader did not graduate from college 
and outlawed for three years any of her teachers or any of the advisors to talk about going to college with the girls. <laughs> So, so my daughter told me that on one of the leaders. I'm like, that's just wrong. <laughs> so, but you know, you never know. I don't have good data on that. But, but what that helps us understand is there's mixed messages on that. But I will tell you, and I, I speak over at BYU a lot, and I get to use Mormon quotes by the prophets. There's some good quotes. And my gosh, the last general conference has some good quotes too um, on prophet and another leader saying women need to be educated and get their degrees. My local church leaders, especially my youth leaders, talked quite a bit to me about education. I remember after my first week of college, I had a breakdown and wanted to quit. I went and visited one of my youth leaders, and she shared an experience that her daughter had and promised me that if I hung in there, I would get better. She gave me advice on things I could make help, um, help make my college experience more enjoyable. I listened to her advice, and she was right. I was fine after that. Isn't that great? Um, now, interestingly, Religious, we looked at religious activity, and that was a strong predictor of actually going. So the more active people that said they were more active in their churches tended to be the ones going to college. Now, is this, am I confusing you, or are you following? There's some interesting data there. Um, all kinds of, of correlations there as well. So a few takeaways. Local church leaders, particularly um, uh, play a particularly important role in encouraging young women to attend in college and graduate from college. And efforts should be made to discuss how young women can integrate marriage, family, and college. And this one is the one that's a predicament. I haven't found a good solution. Um, I, again, live kind of in this bubble. I call it a little bubble. I love living up there, but it's a little bubble. And I used to, especially when my daughter and my sons were home, um, you know, have a lot of people over at the house, and I could hear their conversations, and you could always hear this, you know, I'm gonna get married when I'm this age, and I'm gonna, you know, everything's gonna go right, and this assumption that, you know, you'll find a man, that you will be able to bear children. Are you following me? These assumptions that we have. And you know, I've never, I haven't found a good way to just, you know, here's a pin, you know, you don't wanna pop their bubble, bu bubble and say, life just sucks sometimes. <laughs> Just be ready for it, because things like that may not happen. <laughs> but I don't know how to do that. I don't have the solution. But somehow, we've got to talk to young women more about just the way things are and the choices um, and the situations that they may be in. So fifth, family background. The higher the level of the mother's and father's education, we talked about this before, but this is from Utah data now the more likely, and all of this was statistically found, that their daughters were the ones that prepared for college, went to college, had more support, developed a love for learning. There was one story that I loved, and I'll tell you, we, we dug deep on this love for learning, and the women who had educated mothers and fathers had a love for learning that exceeded the other people. And I remember this one story of, of a father, um, and the daughter said, I got my love for learning from my father. He loved to work in the shop down in the basement. And he would take me down the basement and he would give me wood and nails and a hammer. And all the time I would build and he would be working, he would just talk and teach me. And she said, that's where I developed my love for learning, is with my dad down in his shop. So all of these things, they have parents who set a positive example. All of these benefits were, and People, again, in, in our study, who had more educated people expressed and were correlated with these things. My father has helped me develop a deep love for learning. I remember when I was in second grade, I had an obsession with reading. My father, my dad would suggest books to me and sometimes even read the books at the same time as me so that we could discuss the plots. I remember always trying to read as quickly as he would when we were reading books at the same time so he wouldn't have to wait for me to turn the page. Of course, he didn't really mind waiting for me. I think my father tried to ruin learning for me. He made fun of me when I got put in special reading class because I didn't know how to read. And when I learned to love to read, he would take my books away. When I was in fifth grade, he grounded me for four months from doing everything but multiplication tables. He wanted me to be able to do them all in 30 seconds, one through 12, which I did, 
and now I hardly remember any of them. I don't talk to my father anymore. He was a jerk, and I don't want anything to do with him. You would be shocked at how many, probably a third of the people in our study had stories like that. About a third had really great, and, and not that every educated father and mother are the perfect parents, believe me. My kids would be the first to, to <laughs> tell you my faults. Um, but interesting correlations there. At dinner, my dad would ask each of the kids what we learned that day in school. We not only had to tell what we learned, but express an understanding of the subject. These small things made a difference in their lives. And the literature, when you go back to other studies, these small things make a difference in women's and, and, and boys' and girls' lives. And more educated mothers and fathers tended to do more of those things. Um, a few on the mother's influence. When my mother went back to school and earned her bachelor's degree, it just influenced and empowered me even more. And now I know that I can go back and accomplish that too. She has been a seamstress her whole life. She often encouraged me to go to college and was a living example of what happens when you do not get a good education. My mother knows college is important, and every day she regrets not finishing it so that she could accomplish her dream. She regrets that decision and knows that she would have chosen differently if her parents had shown more encouragement while she was growing up. So if the mother was not educated, the two things that came out very strongly is if that mother started going back to school when that kid could remember, um, even if it was one class at a time, the likelihood that daughter actually went to college was uh, went, you know, increased. And if a mother talked enough about, I wish I would have graduated from college, I wish, you know, those kinds of things, that tended to influence the, the daughter's decisions as well. This one is one of those shocking things to me. We don't have good data to say, we can't say this, but our gut feeling, and those of us in education that have been doing this work, really believe that, um, and maybe you have, Anne, some good data on this, that in Utah, many parents don't support and pay, help support and pay for their kids' education for, for various reasons. 53% of the people in our population said their parents have not paid one penny or would ever help them. Isn't that, does that shock any of you? It just kind of makes us uncomfortable. Um, and so, and, and I remember when I talked about how important it is for a girl to save her own money, we need to do more at helping parents and grandparents. Olene Walker, who's a wonderful, you all probably know her name, she will be the first to say, grandparents need to get an educational, wait, what is it, Utah Education Savings Plan for their grandkids. Um, parents need to, and education of course is more expensive, in Utah it's cheaper, but it is expensive when you get all of the books and stuff. And I don't know, when we say when I was at BYU years ago, I paid my own way through college, do we say that? And then parents say to their kids what? So you can do the same. I have students who are working so hard and can barely get time and they're still going in debt. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. I mean, I think we've seen people up to 50,000 for an undergraduate degree. So parents don't think that we're coddling our little children by helping fund their college. Um, we need to look at this and support. And interestingly, even people that said, my parents didn't have a lot of money. But they, I get like teary-eyed sometimes when I remember these stories, but they, my mother worked you know, extra hours and gave me $250 every semester. And he said, that just made a difference, 250. That would buy a book or two. <laughs> but, but it was something, it was something to encourage them, something, and that meant a lot to them. I have always known that there is absolutely no way my parents can pay for college. It's up to me and good old financial aid. I have never even brought it up because it is something that is already answered by a financial aid situation. Um, my dad even told me that he would help pay after I got married to be sure that I would finish. We do have these things in Utah that a lot of parents say, we'll help you until you get married. And then it's like, 
actually that's when you really need the help even more. So we've got some habits, some thinking that we need to help others understand, even the parents, not just the girls, even the parents and the grandparents as well. And then let's go to a few attitudes, right? Are you following? Are you awake? Are you with me? <laughs> okay. I know this is like some deep stuff, but to me, it's changed the way that I influence. It's changed the way that I interact. I know certain things are more important now. And I've seen lives change just by little old me mentioning little old things here and there that, that maybe don't even take a lot of time. But when we understand these, our influence really can be expanded. And when we understand uh, what we can do, even the small things, it can happen even more. So I'm not going to go through all these. I've just picked a few. But, but um, I do have summaries of all of the, I have 12 snapshots, and they're all on the website. And they're just front and back page. One's on the influence of the father, counselors, different people. They have pictures and bullets, <laughs> not, not tents, but they're, they're on the website that you can look at. So I, I won't go through all these, just a few. Interestingly, when we looked in the qualitative data and said, what did you do in high school that made a difference? By far, the first two. SEOPs or parent-teacher conferences were like, eh, they don't make a big difference. <laughs> All things down here. Career fairs, when, when colleges or, or businesses came into the high school, that was number one. And then does number two look familiar? Getting on college campuses. You can see those other things as well. I couldn't help but put this one in there because I'm a leadership person. That's what I love. So we looked at all their leadership roles between 9th and 12th grade. The most significant finding, by far, was none. If they said none, they had not had leadership in church, school, in nothing. The likelihood, that's a negative, that they went to college. If they even had one role to shine, be a leader, be a secretary of something, whatever. The likelihood, and this, a lot of this data is not cause, we don't cause, it's a kind of a relationship and correlation kinds of things, but it makes us think about it. You know, we need to give young women a chance to lead in different ways. And what happens sometimes? The same girls or young women step up, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it, and it's easy to give it to them. But, uh, and then if, if they don't have an outgoing personality, sometimes they, they kind of get, they just don't have those opportunities. So a few takeaways, schools can host college fairs, provide opportunities for students to take field trips. Um, I didn't talk about this too much, but, but a strong high school GPA is linked to going to college. Efforts can be made to really help people have opportunities to lead. Young women can be encouraged to join school clubs. Oh, I, I didn't, oh, that was back. Um, but engaged, there is a direct correlation in our data between women, young girls, who had re done community work, volunteer work. If they had done volunteer work in high school, the likelihood that they went to college was greater. So that just is a tip. It, it may not cause it, but there's some kind of relationship in there to think about. And oh, this was fascinating too. Working too many hours in high school actually made it so they didn't go to college. And the literature talks about 15 hours, no more than 15 hours. Um, even some of the college uh, stuff says 15 hours. When they became managers or whatever in high school, which sometimes we say, you should, you know, go and work, they end up not going to college as much after that. So we've got to watch that one. And then some people in school, administrators, counselors, teachers, just a few things from that. First of all, out of all of the data that we did, we got the worst responses for school administrators. We only had four even comments. And basically, one was good, and the other three were terrible. And basically, our principals and, and assistant principals in high school are not being very helpful, is what we realized. Um, and I won't read all of this, but um, not a lot of administrators had interest in my education. My assistant principal, uh, told me that I basically couldn't be a teacher someday because it was a very difficult job. <sighs> there was one good one, though, <laughs> so up here. Um, but 
Um, in terms of the counselor, so to me, I'm going to go back to that administrator. Um, sometimes we think, we hear the word mentor and we think, oh, that takes so much time. But what we found in the data was that sometimes it's in the moments. Sometimes, and do principals and assistant principals and people, do they have moments? I mean, are they walking down the hall with some? What we found was sometimes just those moments can make a difference. So my answer is yes, principals can do better. And, we, and I've, I've presented to some uh, administrators throughout the state as well. In terms of counselors, about a third were really good influences, about a third, and we found the same in teaching. And we had some that were just of no influence at all. The counselor in high school talked about my goals for college with my mom there. He asked what I wanted to be, and I told him a veterinarian. He then pulled up my grades, 3.4, and told me I should not waste my time being a veterinarian because I did not have the grades for it. That was devastating to hear, and I believed him. The most influential person at school was a teacher I had. He told me that I could go to any college I wanted, and they would be lucky to have me. He really motivated me to do well in school and reach my potential. I didn't really have anyone talk to me about college. I had a teacher who was really influential. She wanted us to go and learn so much. I felt like it was her passion to teach us and let us know what we could have. I loved her because she cared so much for us. And you know what? I will tell you, we did a focus group with 20 young women in Kanab. I'm going to get all teary-eyed. There is one flippin' amazing woman in Kanab because every one of those young women mentioned the same person as being the most influential in, her, in their lives. I mean, it was the same name. Isn't that amazing? For 20 people to come, it was one teacher that just hit girl after girl and made her feel valued. It was amazing to, to analyze that data. You can see when I'm, I'm sitting at my computer for hundreds of hours, just crying about all these stories. I'm like, this sucks. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, whatever, whatever it was. Um, the worst part of high school was when I had more than one teacher tell me that I could never go anywhere in life, never amount to anything, and never succeed. I know they say sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Well, they do, and they really hurt me. It took a, a while to shake off those hurtful things that uh, were said to me, but I powered through everything and ended up getting super good grades my junior and senior year. A career counselor, I remember, uh, was in junior high, and they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I said a dancer. I'd never danced a day in my life. And they wrote it down and put me in classes to help me get there, PE. <laughs> the next year, I switched to zoology, so they put me in science classes, much more up my alley. But really, what was I supposed to know about careers at 13 and 14? Yikes, a dancer? <laughs> um, I was a statistician for the wrestling coach who was also my English teacher. He was another great influence on me. During my MATC schooling, my senior year, we had to prepare a career packet, which consisted of a resume and a referral letter from an adult. He was um, obliged to provide me the, le the letter for me, and after reading it, I realized how much confidence he had in my abilities to learn and be a wonderful contributor to society. This one letter provided me with the confidence and self-worth I had been struggling to find for years. Isn't that amazing? I mean, over and over we found that these simple conversations and these influencers were the most important of anything else that happened. It was the individual connections with people that changed their lives, people who took the time. And you know what? I do things differently because of this research. I say in papers, that I'm grading, you need to go to graduate school. You're a good thinker. You should, and you know what? It's scary how influential. How many people have gone to graduate school and they never thought about it till I mentioned it? It's like I have too much influence, has too much. Um, but it's amazing how small, sometimes we think people are amazing, but we don't tell them, especially women. And women here in Utah do not know how amazing they are. They do not know. And sometimes we don't share that with each other. And when we do, it can change lives. And I've seen that happen over and over again. 
So what we found in the data is that the conversations are the most powerful thing that we can have. And we looked at all of these. We looked at neighbors. In fact, after I was analyzing this data, my youngest, he's 20 now, but he was a little younger, and um, I realized how powerful neighbors, and you know, I'm living in this neighborhood and we kind of take care of our kids and don't expect someone to influence them for college necessarily, but I'm like, oh, you know, I should start talking to college about my, to my neighborhood kids. And I remember one day my son Scott, my office is, is right at the front of the house, but the garage door opens and then my kids walk through. It's a great place to keep track of your kids. Um, and I remember one time my son opened the door and he said really softly to his friend, he said, go really fast past my mom's office or she'll talk to you about college. <laughs> I'm like, where are you going to college? Are you going to graduate? <laughs> I'm serious, I have really changed. Um, I, take, I try and take those moments. A beautiful thing a couple years ago, um, I was at Walmart with my daughter, and she was about 19, it had been a couple years and, and, uh, since she was in high school. And this substitute teacher she knew, a man, came up to her. I just sat there and watched beauty happen right there. And he's like, Stacy, he was just excited to, to see her, and he's, he's like, what are you doing? Where are you going to college? When are you going to graduate? What are you majoring in? And she was like, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, pure beauty there, <laughs> watching it happen. Somebody that cares and takes a moment for her. And so, the, again, in the research I've done, I've done research on, on um, women in leadership outside of Utah as well. Over and over again, I have found and I call them transformational moments, that these deeper, longer relationships are great and they're the best, but we need to take the moments with each other, with girls, and just say, you know, you're smart. You can do this. You can go to college. You can graduate. Those moments, they told us of those moments over and over and over again as being the most meaningful thing, whether it was coming from a neighbor, whether it was coming from a peer, whether it was coming from a bishop at church or a pastor, um, those were amazing. And then just a couple of slides to finish off there, and then we'll have a couple of minutes for questions, but a couple of last slides. Why did you not attend college? And so we had some people that answered this, and they said economic, so, so that's no surprise, right? But family issues, and, and this is probably not a surprise, but it, we have some good documentation on this, so it's, it's good to understand. Lack of direction, negative school experiences, health issues, time balance. And then for those who dropped out, why did you not continue? Finances, but look at how high, unprepared, uncertain attitude, that's high. There's just a whole bunch of things in there, and encouragement came. And then do you see how high family priorities? That I, I have these priorities and I don't have any other options. I don't know where to get childcare. We have We Care, <laughs> UVU. Uh, USU does great, you, you too, I know <laughs> from USU, has some great childcare, especially on those campuses in, in, um, throughout the state, uh, like in Tooele, I've been out there and, and some different places. Um, but sometimes we just don't know what the resource, resources are. But I will tell you, every single institution has people that can help you through that. We have a Women's Success Center. Um, USU has other things. Uh, we were just down at the University of Utah with the Women's Resource Center. Um, Dixie has a Women's Resource Center. There's places that women, even though they think it's impossible, if they will just walk through the doors and sit down with someone, and that's super scary, right? I was out in uh, Vernal. Uh, in about three months ago speaking on uh, confidence, but I met with a group on education and had a woman who was in her 40s tell a story that was just amazing. And, and she went to, and this was just a satellite campus, so the parking was easy. I mean, you've had to deal with UVU parking to get here. Um, so you can just drive up. And she, seven times, she drove in the parking lot and couldn't get out of her car and only till her son, who was going to college, said, Mom, you're going with me. She couldn't, she was so scared. She was so scared to get out and walk in. She just couldn't even get herself, and her son 
And he just grabbed his mom and walked her in. And as soon as she got in there, I mean, she, the other women that had influenced her were in the same room. And she just talked about what each of them did to, and, and now, I mean, looking at her, she is just amazing and reaching out and doing so much in her community and smart. She knows she's smart now. Oh, uh, and amazing story. She had, a, she told it a lot better than that, but just letting you know. So this is good information to know as well. So many quotes, but impact on family and society. Surely a woman needs education to be well-informed and independent. It is not only through knowledge skill that she can make a positive impact, not only to her family, but to the society at large. And then, so as we conclude, you know, taking action, a couple of things uh, for the work that, that I'm doing, and then I love, then just, you gotta just work your magic, and that, that just means you, you just work your networks and influence others and help them understand. But one, I would really encourage you, that data and, and knowledge and understanding is powerful when we know what's out there and what the research says. So I would encourage you to read the briefs that we have online. We actually have cards that give you the website and the blogs and different things. But we also brought some stacks of 50 cards for you. I would, um, and Bonnie, where's Bonnie? Bonnie's out there. Bonnie, she, thank you, Bonnie. She has brought, she lugged over a bunch, but Bonnie has done all the logistics for this event too. So thank you, Bonnie. Appreciate that. Um, so there's stacks, and you are welcome if you have people that, that you want to distribute those uh, information packets to, um, and, and really it gives you information about online. And review the online resources. We have great video clips for girls, and I mean, just short little clips that are fun, and other resources online for parents at home, for K through 12, for college people. Join the blog and other social media. Just be informed. And Anne, who did the wonderful introduction, thank you so much, um, her website has, and they've got a table out there as well, has excellent resources as well and a listserv. Just getting that information can help. But then again, it's you. I mean, we can only do a certain amount. It's you in your classes, in, you know, in, with your own students, with your kids at home, with your grandkids. I don't care who. Um, but do something and help other people understand. I do believe that we can, and I think we're getting closer and closer. I feel this energy in the women in leadership. I mean, just in the last year or two, there's just some new energy that there's hope and there's things, and we, we're getting why women need to be educated and have voice. And let's, let's just build off this energy to help more girls and women uh, become, you know, really, become who they can really uh, have the potential to become. And so in conclusion, formal post-secondary education is a critical foundation for girls, Utah girls and women of all ages, so that they can be fully develop themselves toward reaching their inherent potential. And all of us can assist in some way to help more young women do just that. Thank you so much.